Welcome to Russian History Retold, episode 144, The Leaders. Last time, we discussed the opening battles of the Crimean War between the Turks and the Russians, and how everything was being set up for this just horrific war that was to go on for a few years. But before we get into those major battles, I wanted to tell you about the people who actually were the leaders and the field marshals and generals and admirals of this war that was to come about because many of the problems that occurred because of their decisions were what was to cause so much suffering amongst the, uh, not just the soldiers, but the people of Crimea. So let's go over them. And this is kind of a non-scripted podcast. I'm just going over some notes that I have on each one of the generals and the rulers of the countries. Now, the people we'll be talking about are the heads of state and the generals from Great Britain, France, Sardinia, the Ottoman Empire, and of course, Russia. Now, Sardinia is in there because they did have a not insubstantial number of men in there. It weren't a major power, but the ruler of Sardinia was to become the first uh, king of Italy, as we will find out shortly. So the first person we start with is in England. And it's Queen Victoria, who was born on May 24th of 1819 and was to live until January 22nd of 1901. Uh, she was the uh, head of England for quite a long time, from 1837 to her death in 1901. Uh, she married her first cousin, Prince Albert of saxe goburg and Gotha, in 1840. Uh, they had nine children, and they married into the whole royal and noble families all through Europe. Uh, she was considered, and her nickname was, the Grandmother of Europe, one of whom was uh, uh, the wife of Nicholas II, as we remember from our podcast on him. So she was an extremely popular queen, and it was part of what they would call the Victorian era of uh, England. Uh, she really didn't have very much influence on the Crimean War. That one was you know, because she was more a titular head of... England, and she kind of reigned through her ministers. I'm not going to go very much into the woman, so we're going to move on to uh, Field Marshal Fitzroy James Henry Somerset, the first Baron Raglan, and he's going to come up a lot in this Crimean War conflict. He was the commander of the British troops sent to the Crimea in 1854. And it was early success was at the Battle of Alma, which we're going to be discussing in the next podcast. But from there, he has some problems in history. Uh, it was his order that wasn't clear enough that caused the fateful charge of the Light Brigade at the Battle of Balaclava. Uh, he then won, obviously, the Battle of Inkerman, which we're also going to discuss in the uh, next podcast. Not next one, but the one after that. Uh, then the Sevastopol assault just didn't seem to work very well. And it really weighed upon him. And he was to die in uh, June of uh, 1855 during this siege of Sevastopol from dysentery and what people say is a clinical depression. Uh, he was a, uh, you know, a very long-time military man. He was born on uh, September 30th of 1788. Uh, again, died on June 29th of 1855, and he was a military man uh, that moved up over the years. He started as a uh, coronet in the 4th Light Dragoons in 1804. He moved up, and obviously because of this, he did fight in the uh, uh, battles against Napoleon uh, in 1812 through 1814. Uh, was very well regarded. Uh, they thought very highly of him. He was very well decorated and, you know, moved on and then moved up in the British uh, Army. Then he was promoted to uh, full general on the 21st of February of 1854 and moved up to the full generalship. And the first one was a temporary rank. And then it was full generalship on June 20th of 1854. And it was basically to defend Constantinople at first. But then it said, we now have to go to Sevastopol, and he was the man chosen to lead the British in this. Uh, we don't want to go too deep into that because then it would reveal too much of what's going on. 
in the future podcasts. But he was a pretty famous man in his time. Uh, he married Lady Emily Harriet Wellesley Poole, uh, the daughter of the Earl of Mornington. And they had two sons, both of whom were uh, barons, uh, Honorable Arthur William Fitzroy Somerset and Richard Henry Fitzroy Somerset. And that's him. The next one is George Hamilton Gordon, the fourth Earl of Aberdeen, who was born on the 28th of January of 1784, and he passed on uh, December 14th, 1860. Uh, he was also pretty uh, important at the time. He was the Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1852. Uh, he formed the new government it was a kind of a coalition in 1852 of free traders, uh, Peelites, and Whigs. He was more liberal uh, as against the uh, Tory conservative group. Within his cabinet, you had uh, Lord John Russell, uh, Lord Palmerston, who comes in to play quite a bit in this podcast. And there were certain other members that were very uh, important to his foreign ministry, obviously, and his foreign policies. Palmerston and Russell, of course, the most, but they fought all the time. They always debated. Uh, these two, the three actually, debated about whether to uh, allow France to become part of an ally system that they had developed, especially uh, uh, Bonaparte, uh, Napoleon III. They finally decided, yes, they did want to have him, but they also viewed France with a great deal of skepticism. So as much as they wanted to have France as an ally, they actually wanted them more as not being uh, people that they had to worry about anymore. They wanted to keep them at arm's length, but they didn't want to have them as a uh, antagonist anymore. So this was very much of what uh, Lord uh, or Earl of Aberdeen was thinking about when he joined with the French to go into uh, the Crimean War. In all reality, Prime Minister Aberdeen was not for going into the uh, Crimean War, but he was forced to by public pressure and within his own government. Uh, it would also lead to the downfall of his coalition when the war did not go as well as planned. So he went down and was out of the picture before the end of the war. Uh, we now go to James Simpson. Uh, he was a general of the British Army, and he was born in uh, 1792 and died in April 18th of 1868. Uh, he served with the 1st Regiment of the Foot Guards during the Peninsular War against uh, Napoleon and in the Waterloo Campaign. And then he moved on to the uh, 28th or 29th, excuse me, Regiment of Foot in Mauritius and Bengal. So he traveled quite a bit with the British as their empire expanded. In February of 1855, he went to Crimea to act as the uh, Chief of Staff to Commander Lord Raglan. When Raglan died on June 28th, Simpson reluctantly took command of the army, but he resigned on November 10th and was succeeded by Sir William Codrington. So he was there for a brief period of time as the head of the uh, British expeditionary forces. It didn't last very long, and he gave up to William John Codrington, who was born in 1804 and survived until 1884. He was a British general and also a politician later on in life. Uh, his father, Admiral Sir Edward Codrington, was the victor of the Battle of Navarino. And he was a very famous British admiral, and his son followed suit, but not into the Navy, into the Army. And he entered the Army as an ensign in 1821, and then moved up to lieutenant, captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, and just kept on moving up through, and, you know, he he was just one of those guys that was on the upward mobile track because of his background. Uh, then he uh, became a general officer in 1854, and Lord Raglan told him to take care of, uh, or take command of the 1st Brigade of the Light Division, uh, which was the armies of the 7th, 23rd, and 33rd Regiments. And uh, he was one of the commanders in the uh, Battle of Alma. And we're going to hear more about him on the next podcast. And he was the one that just 
led his men in a charge to the great redoubt and carried it, despite having never really been in active service before. This is his first real active duty that he had, even though he moved up. He was moving up just because he was a very good uh, administrator, you might say. But he showed great bravery uh, during this battle. And then the next time was at the Battle of Inkerman, which we'll go over in a few podcasts from now. So he was pretty... uh, pretty brave for a man who had never really fought before and he showed a lot of different uh uh honor was given a lot of different honors because of all of this and in uh 1855 in november uh he succeeded sir james simpson as commander of chief instead of uh, sir colin campbell who was supposed to take over uh nobody really knows why he was given this command and he was uh you know, basically given this uh, because of his background. Uh, And he was involved in the final evacuation of the Crimea in July of 1856. So he was one that was uh, an odd person within the British uh, leadership. Uh, How he got there, very few people know, aside from, you know, as I mentioned, his family ties. Uh, But he did show some, you know, inkling to be a good fighting general during the Battle of uh, Alma and Inkerman. Next up are the French, and they're led by Napoleon III. Napoleon III was born on the 20th of April of 1808 and uh, died on January 9th of 1873. And he was the first president of the French Second Republic, and then he became the emperor as Napoleon III of the Second French Empire. Uh, Of course, as I mentioned before, he was the nephew an heir of Napoleon I, Napoleon Bonaparte, and he was the first president of France to be elected by a direct vote. But when he was blocked by the Constitution and Parliament from running for a second term, he organized a coup d'etat in 1851 and took the throne as Napoleon III on December 2nd, 1852, which was the 48th anniversary of Napoleon I's coronation. Uh, What he really wanted to do as the emperor was to reassert French influence in Europe and around the world. Uh, he wanted to really boost the nationalistic fervor of France that he saw had really slipped away after the uh, losses by his uncle. Uh, he t- wanted to get a tighter tie with Great Britain because he viewed that as very good economically and would be a, a good idea all around. Uh, And he was also very anti-Russian because he felt that he was the supporter of the Catholics and the Russians were of the heretical Orthodox, and especially these little infights as we discussed before in the uh, Holy Land. So one of his people that he supported as a top general and the one who was going to lead the French in the Crimean War was one of the people that helped him in his coup d'etat, and that's Jacques Leroy de Saint-Arnaud, who was born on the 20th of August in 1801, and died uh, right after the Battle of Alma, which we'll find out, on September 29th, 1854. He was the French Minister of War, and then became the Commander-in-Chief of the Army of the East during the Crimean War. He entered the Army in 1817, but in 10 years, he only had the lowest commissioned grade. He resigned, quit the Army, then he returned when he turned the age of 30, and he became a sub-lieutenant. And he kept moving up, but part of the problem was there were a lot of scandals in his private life, a lot of debt, and then he went to Algeria as a captain of the French Foreign Legion. There, he actually started showing some promise. He distinguished himself on a number of occasions and had risen to the rank of Major General. He came back to to, uh, Paris, and he superintended the military operations of the coup d'etat for Napoleon, and then he became a marshal of France and a senator, and he was the head of the war office until the war began, and he was sent out to lead the French forces in the Crimean War. Uh, During the Battle of Alma, it was very apparent that he was sick, and we'll discuss that a little bit more in the next podcast, but he wasn't to last very long. And he gave up his life and then his command to Francois Certain Canrobert. Uh, came from a very obscure family who were nobles, but they had to you know, run after the French Revolution. Uh, and he was briefly imprisoned, his family was. 
uh, during the reign of terror. Uh, he was educated at, at St. Cyr, uh, became a commissioned sub-lieutenant in 1828, and then, as all the others, went to Algeria to uh, control that region. Uh, he was part of the expedition of Mascara, the capture of Telamine, and was rep uh, promoted because of this courageous battling and his, uh, his conduct during this war. And he also came back to Paris, helped the coup d'etat, and that's where he became a general and field marshal for the French army. And he was given command of the uh, army just a few days after the Battle of Alma when St. Arnaud passed away. The problem was he didn't get along very well with Lord Raglan, and basically they kept on arguing and disagreeing about when to go, when not to go, when to attack, when to, to hold back. Uh, it was not a very good relationship with Raglan. And uh, after that, he decided that he was going to leave, and he went back to uh, France in August of 1855. Then the next person who were to take over is Amiabel Pellissier. Uh He was a you know, family of uh, artisans, very uh, prominent and well-to-do. And, of course, many times this is when you go into the army. And he went up and he continued going up, but he was considered a, a bulldog and was not uh, a very nice person when it came to battle. There was uh, uh, one incident uh, where he was supposedly suffocated an entire Arab tribe in the Dara caves. And uh, there was so much indignation in Europe that they pulled him away from there but gave him a higher rank because, frankly, he was very successful there, but he was considered kind of a butcher. And after uh, Cameron Robert resigned, Pellissier went to the Crimea, and he was the commander-in-chief of the French forces before the siege of Sevastopol. He was very, he was a kind of a tough guy here in the Crimean War to and kind of pinned down because he was of one mind, just attack, attack, and attack, and never give up. And he was uh, given the job of finally getting Sevastopol to surrender, but he did it at such an incredible cost that there's a, it was not considered a, a, one of those positive figures in the Crimean War. The next uh, French general we're going to go over is a very fascinating one, and I, I think you should look deeper into him, you know, just read about him. Uh, his name is Francois Achille Bazin, and that's spelled B-A-Z-A-I-N-E. The reason that I recommend it, he was a field marshal and he served distinguished service, but there's something in his, he was tried for treason and sentenced to death because of the uh, the Prussian-Franco uh, war. And it was because he gave up the uh, his men, it, he surrendered his troops to the uh, Prussians in the, uh, that war. And he was vilified by the people, and he was, for no real good reason. I mean, the man was an amazing general. He really served well for France. He was determined to leave from the front. He wasn't scared to get hurt. Uh, he, was, he was just amazing with his bravery. And sometimes they call it even foolhardy because he was wounded numerous occasions. And twice his horse was shot down from under him. But he was another one of those French generals who served in the Crimea. Was pretty amazing for what he did. Uh, saved his troops many times, but also showed him a great deal of bravery. And I really suggest that you read a little bit more about him because he led a very fascinating life. Uh, the next one is uh, Patrice de Macmillan, the Duke of Magenta. Uh, he was the Chief of State of France from 1873 to 1875, and he was the first President of the Third Republic. Uh, he was born in 1808 and died in 1893. He was a French general to start with. He served in the Army, again, in the Algiers, and he was a commander of the Foreign Legion. And during the Crimean War, he really distinguished himself at the Battle of Malakoff, which was at Sevastopol, and during which he re uh, reputedly uttered the famous quotation now attributed to him, Je suis, je reste, which means, here I am, 
here I stay. And, you know, I, I apologize ahead of time if any of you think that uh, my French pronunciation of those words was incorrect. I did spend some time in France as a student, but that was in 1972. So my French has not been, uh, is a little bit rusty from there. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, we're going to go over to the Ottomans now. Uh, led by a very also fascinating man, Omar Pasha. Omar Pasha was originally born as Mihailo Latis. And uh, he was born in the Austrian territory as an Orthodox Christian. Um, and he was an Austrian soldier, but the problems were that he was facing charges of embezzlement. So he fled to Ottoman Bosnia. And in order to save himself, he converted to Islam because, frankly, if you're going to move up anywhere in the Ottoman Empire, you had to be a Muslim. Uh, he crushed many rebellions throughout the empire as he moved up, and he was considered a very uh, energetic leader, you might say. And he was the commander in the Crimean War for the Ottomans when they defeated Russia, especially Sevastopol. Uh, he got one of his big breaks is he married a very wealthy uh, Turkish woman, and he from a very wealthy family, and they were able to help him with their ties to get him up. But it turned out he was quite a uh, quite an able-bodied uh, military man. But it was a meteoric rise. I mean, it was stunning to see how fast up he moved. But when the Crimean War broke out, he was important to the uh, defense of Caliphate and uh, defeated 40,000 Russians at Eupatoria in the Crimea later on. And he was considered strict but ruthless. He was a disciplinarian, and they say he was revered and respected by his men, but actually from what we see, he was quite feared by them. Uh, the other leader of the Ottomans was Antoni Alexander Ilinsky, uh, also known as Mehmet Iskander. Uh, he was a Polish Ottoman military officer. He started in Poland and was very anti-Russian. He was part of the independence activist, uh, activism and insurgency, and he helped with the struggle of the Hungarians against the Austrian-Russian alliance in 1848, which Russia helped to crush as the policeman of Europe. So he moved up again. He was another person who kind of converted into Islam. Uh, and he moved into there, and he became Mehmed Iskander, and he just another meteoric rise up in the uh, military ranks. And he was a lieutenant colonel in the Ottoman Empire, and he had another name, Iskander Beg. And he was also in the Crimean War. Uh, he was charged with organizing and training the irregular troops, known as the Bashi Bazooks, along the Danube, which is where most of his uh, time was spent. And he was a commander of the cavalry and raided the Russians consistently and persistently. And uh, in 1861, he passed away after returning to Istanbul with full honors. And then we go to the last of the Allies. We go to the King of Sardinia, which is Victor Emmanuel. Victor Emmanuel became the King of Italy and was the first unified Italian leader since the 6th century. And he was born on March 14th, 1820, and died in January of 1878. But during the time of the Crimean War, he was the King of Sardinia. Uh, he sent his troops in there, and it was... His, his uh, minister, Cavour, didn't want to go in there. And he was worried about the, the power of Russia and the expense of doing it. But Victor Emmanuel believed that he needed to do this to help the Italian cause because then he would get an alliance with Britain and, most importantly, with France, which would allow them, because of his help for them, would let him become the unified king of Italy, which is explaining why the Sardinians, of all people, would come in into the battle in the Crimean War. And finally, we have Alfonso Ferreira la Mormora, and he was the uh, head of the army, the Crimean expedition, uh, born in 1804. He survived until 1878. And he was uh, a rather interesting uh, general there. Uh, led a small band of men, but not inconsequential to the final battle. So now let's get to the Russian side. 
We start with, of course, Nicholas I, uh, the Tsar of all Russia, who came to power in 1825, uh, an arch conservative, and he's probably one of the main reasons why this war came about. It was his, you know, devoutness in some respects because he believed that he was the the protector of the Orthodox and had to protect the Holy Land, and that Constantinople was a town that he needed to take over. He believed that he needed to restore Orthodoxy to all these regions that had it taken away by the Turks. And by doing so, he was so single-minded, he didn't look at what was going around him. He didn't understand what was going on in Great Britain. He didn't understand public opinion. He thought Queen Victoria, she makes the decisions, as I do in Russia. Uh, he didn't understand how to be diplomatic in this and how to avoid war. He thought Russia was still the same country that had defeated Napoleon under his uh, predecessor, his brother Alexander I. He was not supposed to be king, as I mentioned in the podcast about his rule. It was supposed to be Constantine, but he took over nonetheless. And uh, it's been suggested that because of the uh, the losses in the Crimean Wars, that he died of depression, you might say, that he felt so bad about what was going on that he just gave up and let his successor take over, which was Alexander II. Alexander, he saw this as a tragedy, and he needed to end the war as soon as possible. Uh, he became emperor in March of 1855, and it was a year later that the war was to end, and he knew that he needed to do that. And it's been said that the Crimean War and the tragedy there is one of the reasons that he believed that he needed to free the serfs, that it was God's will to punish Russia for what they had done with serfdom and that it needed to end and the way they punished him was the losses at, in the Crimean War. So now let's get to the field marshals and the generals that were serving under both Nicholas and Alexander. And the first one is Alexander Sergeyevich Menshikov. Uh, he was made an adjutant uh, general in 1817 and an admiral in 1833. He was born on August 26, 1787 and would die on May 2nd of 1869. He was originally the uh, commander-in-chief on land and sea for the Russian army. He commanded the army at Alma and Inkerman and showed an absolute lack of competence. He had no military talent, it seemed, and he just led one disaster after another. And he was uh, removed from command on February 15th of 1855 shortly before Nicholas had died, uh, and he was replaced by Prince Mikhail Dmitrievich Gorchikov. And Gorchikov is another fascinating uh, man that uh, we're going to get into quite a bit during this uh, these coming podcasts. Although we are going to mention quite a bit about Menshikov, and especially in the next uh, podcast on the Battle of Alma. Well, going back to uh, Gorchikov, he was born in 1793 and would live until 1861 and, uh, when he retired in Warsaw. And he was a Russian general of the artillery from a pretty famous family, the Gorchikovs. And he commanded the Russian forces in the later stages of the Crimean War. And then he served as the uh, head of the Kingdom of Poland from 1856 until his death in 1861. Now, he entered the Russian army in 1807, uh, obviously he took part in the campaigns against uh, Napoleon, but he did really distinguished himself at the Battle of Borodino and then at Bautzen and a number of other battles as they chased Napoleon across Europe. I uh, quickly developed his career and by 1824 as a major general, and he demonstrated quite a bit of bravery during the Russo-Turkish War. And in 1829, he did something very uh, interesting. He swam, he was one of the first military men to swim across the Danube. So, pretty athletic man in his youth. I was pre present at the sieges of Silistria and Shumna during these uh, wars against uh, the, the numerous, I believe, nine wars uh, of the Russo-Turkish wars. Uh, he served under Field Marshal Peskevich and was the head of the uh, staff of the acting army, and he really did quite well 
in these battles as we go through the different uh, wars leading up to the Crimean War, like uh, the battle against the Hungarian rebels. And he was also representative for Russia in London uh, when the Duke of Wellington passed away. So he's really well regarded by quite a number of the different uh, combatants here. Uh, he became the commander-in-chief, I said before, when uh, Menshikov, who was now disgraced in 1855, and he was the leader of the defense of Sevastopol and the final retreat into the northern part of the town. And he was there uh, and helped sign the uh, peace treaty in Paris when the war was over. We now go over to Pavel Nakimov, who was uh, one of the most famous admirals in Russian naval history, and he was the commander of the naval and land forces during the siege of Sevastopol. Uh, he was born in 1802 and would live until July 12, 1855, during his defense of the uh, Battle of Sevastopol. Uh, he's really considered quite highly uh, within Russian history and Soviet history for that matter. Uh, there's Nakamov Naval Schools, uh, there's the Order of Nakamov, or the Nakamov Medal, and it was one of the highest military decorations in the Soviet Union and to this day in Russia. So his, his career was pretty amazing, one of which was a, a three-year voyage, which was a trip around the world with famous explorer Mikhail Petrovich Lazarev. So we'll be discussing quite a bit about him as we get into the Battle of Sevastopol. Another one is Vasily Zvoiko, who was a uh, admiral in the Russian Navy, uh, was a Ukrainian, uh, took part in the Battle of Navarino, and he twice circumnavigated the Earth, which was an amazing feat at the time, and that was about 1838 to 18, uh, well, actually 1835 to 1838. During the Crimean War, Zavojko led the defense and the siege of Petropavlovsk against the British and French troops, and uh, he repelled them despite having far fewer uh, troops, and he even captured the British banner I mean, in 1854, which is pretty amazing. Uh, we're going to go over him quite a bit. He was born in 1809, uh, died in 1898, and had uh, you know, an admirable career. And he was the uh, naval general auditor when he returned to St. Petersburg after the war. Uh, quite a brilliant man. Uh, which is amazing when we start looking at these Russians. Uh, they were outnumbered, outgunned, and yet they had incredible commanders aside from Menshikov who were able to defend Sevastopol despite, you know, just terrible odds. Uh, one of the other ones who were involved here was uh, Nikolai Muravyov Amursky, uh, who was born in 1809, would live till 1881. He was a statesman, diplomat, as well as a uh, major general in the uh, Russian army, and he was involved in quite a number of different uh, expeditions, uh, especially with uh, Eastern Siberia. He was involved there, and he was also involved in the negotiation with the Chinese uh, about a border along the Amur River, which we had discussed in one of the previous uh, podcasts. The next one is Yefimi Putyatin. Uh, Putyatin was also involved in a number of uh, diplomatic missions to China as well as to Japan. And he was also in that crew that sailed around the world with Lazarev. And he also participated in the Caucasian Wars of 1838 to 1839. Uh, he was involved in the, in the uh, Crimean War, but was more importantly, very important as a naval attaché sent to London at the end of the war and trying to resolve the differences between Great Britain and Russia. Then we finally come to Igor Tolstoy. Uh, he was a Russian lieutenant general, uh, also became a governor of different regions of Russia, like Taganrog, Kaluga, and Penza. Uh, born in 1802, he would live until 1874, but he was uh, very important in the the war effort. Uh, he was also a uh, aide-de-camp to Major General at the time, uh, Menshikov, in the uh, Russo-Persian Wars. 
Uh, he participated in numerous actions throughout his career, and he was very important in the uh, defense of Taganrog, and especially during the siege in 1855. So there you have it. These are the major people that we're going to be discussing in the Crimean War that comes up. Uh, we see the mistakes made uh, by people like Menshikov, uh, Ragan, Lord Raglan, uh, St. Arnaud, who would just survive a little bit longer, just one more podcast on him. And so now you have a background in all these people. So the next podcast, which I'm going to be recording shortly, we'll get more into depth into the battles, and we will start with the Battle of Alma. So I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Uh, remember to join us on Facebook. We're having some great discussions there. Uh, one recently about uh, Putin and whether he had blinked, according to an article in the New York Times, which some disagree with, some agree with. Uh, also, at my blog site at RussianRulersHistory.com, uh, we've had some interesting uh, posts there. Uh, one of which was a you know kind of a argument against my feeling that Nicholas II was one of the worst uh, czars of all time. Uh, I always appreciate that. If you disagree with me, that's fine. Come out, say it. Uh, you know, that's where discussions come about. That's where truths come about when it comes to history. So, again, hope you all enjoyed it. And as always, das vidanya is spasibo bolshoya.